Thank you so much for the extraordinary privilege of being with you today. I am deeply touched. Oh, thank you. I'm deeply touched by the honor you have bestowed. I was last on this stage almost 30 years ago as I walked forward to receive my own degree. Much to my surprise and delight, my husband, Dennis McAuliffe, who was then on the faculty at Scarborough, stepped forward to hood me. I'm so happy that he can share today with me as well. This year also marks the 30th anniversary of a splendid lecture series entitled The Life of Learning. Each spring, the American Council of Learned Societies showcases a renowned scholar who is asked to reflect on a lifetime of work and on the larger institutional life of scholarship. The stellar list of speakers fe features people like Clifford Geertz, Yi Fu Tuan, Peter Brown, and Natalie Zeman Davis, all of whom have been connected with the U of T. In the spirit of that lecture series, I'd like to spend these few moments with you thinking about that larger institutional context of our work. I realize that not all of you will take university positions, but I'm sure that each of you will keep close connections with higher education. When I began my own graduate work here, Robarts Library had just been built. Xerox machines were a novelty, and in fact, one of my graduate professors frequently admonished his students to read the damn article, don't just Xerox it. <laughs> Yet despite such signs of progress, the academic world was a reasonably stable realm. We were sure someone would recognize the value of our wonderful U of T degrees and would hire us to replicate the lives of our professors, to teach large lecture courses and small seminars, to continue our research projects and secure funding for new ones. But the higher education terrain that you face is far more turbulent than the one that greeted me 30 years ago. From conversations this fall with younger pre-tenure colleagues at the Library of Congress, I know that turbulence feels rather fraught and frightening. If I can leave you with one thought this afternoon, I'd like to counter that concern with this declaration. I firmly believe that you are graduating into the most exciting period in the history of higher education. Yes, I know that is a big statement. And I also know that colleges and universities in North America and beyond are beset with problems. As a dean and then a president, I was frequently mired in them. On both sides of the borders, we have politicians cutting budgets and questioning the value of basic research. On both sides of the border, we struggle to support our students and to fund our faculty. And yet, within the last few years, we've begun to see the glimmers of a future for colleges and universities, and for you, as the new generation of faculty, that will be transformative. There are lots of ideas and innovations fueling this transformation, but I'll focus on only two. The first is what I call the learner at the center. Rather than fitting students to our current schedules and structures, university learning will become more distributed and more individually directed. Highly motivated students are already racing through the non-credit online courses offered by the likes of edX and Coursera. They are then placing into upper division work and in the spirit of a liberal arts education, they are sampling subjects without fear of grade point consequences. The flip side of this is talent identification. Stories of the Pakistani girl coming in tops with an online physics course or the boy from Mongolia who aced one on computer circuits. Those stories have inspired admissions officers across this continent. The young man is now a freshman at MIT and the even younger woman spoke at the World Economic Forum in January. I hope we can get her to Bryn Mawr. 
or the University of Toronto. If new forms of online learning are decoupling the class from the classroom, competency-based programs are dismantling credit hours as the currency of degrees. For more than a century, time metrics, semesters and credit hours and years, have been the building blocks of our educational structures, the way we unitize knowledge, the way we define degrees, the way we assign faculty workloads. This fall, Southern New Hampshire University launched College for America, the first competency-based program to be approved by the US Department of Education for federal financial aid. College for America and other new programs like it shift the focus from time spent to learning achieved. In effect, they say, show me what you've learned. I don't care how quickly or slowly you learn as long as you can ultimately demonstrate mastery of these areas of knowledge and those skills and abilities. Southern New Hampshire is not an elite institution. Its president once told me it serves a population for whom the alternative is nothing at all. But as scholars of disruptive innovation or creative destruction are quick to tell us, disruption starts at the bottom and then moves up. The second big trend is the emergence of globe-spanning institutions and networks. Examples of this are proliferating. Cornell, Georgetown, Northwestern, and Carnegie Mellon share a campus in Qatar. NYU has one in Abu Dhabi and opened its Shanghai branch this fall. Duke has a collaborative venture in Kunshan, China, and Yale's Liberal Arts College in Singapore welcomed its first class in August. Not all universities will build new campuses. But many are rapidly expanding student and faculty exchanges, developing co-taught transnational courses, and creating dual degree programs. As you heard in my years at Bryn Mawr, I built a network of the best women's colleges around the world, finding ready partners in Tokyo, Seoul, Delhi, and Jeddah. I predict that most of you will have a chance to work on far distant campuses, either actually or virtually, that you will see student flows through network systems, and that your own teaching and research will be continually enhanced by these global connections. But big questions confront, confront both the trends that I've described, the learner at the center and globe-spanning institutions. Going global forces us to address pressing issues of human rights and academic freedom. As a board member of the American Council on Education, I spent hours in vigorous debates with other presidents about both the upside and the downside of university internationalization. Looking at learner-centered education, it's fair to say that the new experiments in online and competency-based courses are way overhyped. And there are no common standards or quality controls. But let's remember, they're still experiments. I spoke last week with a colleague who is at the center of what edX is doing, and he said, it's really been like trying to ride a bicycle as you're building it. Many of us worry about equity, fearing that the results of these experiments Will broad, could broaden the gap between rich and poor? Will students at elite universities and colleges continue to enjoy lots of faculty attention while those at less advantaged institutions are consigned to a world of outsourced, substandard instruction and devalued degrees? Given these concerns, why would I continue to assert that we are on the cusp of the most exciting period in the history of higher education? My answer is really one single word, learning. These trends will enhance student learning. They will help students dive faster and deeper into new areas. They will allow each student to progress at a pace 
that suits individual abilities and interests. They will connect students from around the globe. They will offer access and opportunity to those who are currently shut out of any form of higher education. A characteristic that I share with every one of you graduating today is that we all love learning. We are in this education business because we ourselves are learners and we want to pass that passion for learning on to others. You will have a chance to do that in ways I could never have imagined when I sat where you are sitting now. You won't just inherit an academic world, you'll create one. I congratulate each one of you and I eagerly await that future that you will forge. Thank you.